And when you look on current projections, the euro area will take at least eight years to have a recovery that Canada achieved in two. And I'd like to, uh, tonight, draw on Jim's legacy to reflect on how the euro area could avoid another lost decade. Since the crisis, euro area nominal GDP has increased by a mere 5%, so 5% in the last seven years. Consumer price inflation is already below zero. Core inflation is running low. And this is a potentially dangerous situation. Low nominal growth is intensifying the euro area's debt burden, and the fear of stagnation is holding back spending and investment. The ECB's actions last week were important not least because they removed any residual concerns about whether it has the will or the means to meet its price stability mandate. However, the ECB alone cannot eliminate the risks of prolonged stagnation. These risks exist primarily because in most respects, the euro area is unfinished. Specifically, with limited cross-border banking, savings don't flow to potential investments. Modest cross-border equity flows mean inadequate risk sharing. And moreover, by design, there are virtually no cross-border fiscal flows, so fiscal space is separated from fiscal need. So the question is, if increased flexibility isn't sufficient, it's important but not sufficient, what else is required? And the answer is to build risk-sharing institutions that are present in any successful currency union. And that means financial integration and common fiscal arrangements. In other words, both private and public risk sharing. It's not realistic to expect the private sector to do everything that the public sector will not. The euro area stands out from federal systems like the US, Canada, Germany, where the impact of localized shocks to income is reduced by between one-tenth and one-fifth via centralized fiscal transfers. As the four presidents argued in their report, European Monetary Union will not be complete until it builds mechanisms to share fiscal sovereignty. And the possible options for sharing fiscal risk range from a transfer union to a pooled employment insurance mechanism. The latter would appear to be an opportunity to combine the current enthusiasm for labor market reform with the longer term imperative to build elements of an efficient transfer union and it would ensure that risk sharing was based on cyclical rather than structural labor market problems. So that's a longer term element. What of shorter term fiscal dynamics in the euro area? I just ask you to consider the following comparison between the euro area and the United Kingdom. In the euro area, the private sector continues to generate surplus savings of 3.5% of GDP. Those savings must be recycled efficiently in order to generate a sustainable expansion. In the UK, the private sector has now moved back from a large surplus to balance. Unemployment in the euro area is 11.5%, fully twice the rate in the United Kingdom. Gross general government debt in the euro area is roughly the same as in the UK, and it's below the average, both for both countries, it's below the average of advanced economies. The weighted average yield on 10-year euro area sovereign debt is 1%, less, 50 basis points less than the yield, uh, comparable yield in the UK. Yet the euro area's fiscal deficit is half of that in the UK, and its structural de deficit, according to the IMF, is less than one-third as large. It's difficult to avoid the conclusion that if the euro area were a country, fiscal policy would be substantially more supportive. However, it's tighter than in the UK, even though Europe still lacks effective risk-sharing mechanisms and has, in relative terms, for the euro area as a whole, it's not true for Ireland, but for euro area as a whole, relatively inflexible uh, in economy. So a more constructive fiscal policy would help recycle surplus private savings and mitigate the tail risk of stagnation. It would help bridge the drag from structural reforms on nominal spending, and it would also, I'd argue, be consistent with Europe's longer-term direction of travel towards greater integration. 
it would, in the words of the Flaherty's, it would be bold, but it would be favored by fortune. So let me conclude. One of the great strengths of uh, Jim Flaherty was he understood the importance of having a plan, like the plan you have here, and implementing that plan diligently and clearly. And that wasn't just because, as policymakers, that's our job. It's our job to devise these plans and implement them. But it's also because in the absence of such a plan, businesses and households shy away from taking risk. And we need that risk for the global expansion. To argue that Europe needs a comprehensive, coherent plan to anchor expectations, build confidence, and to fully escape its debt trap. And that that plan does not begin and end with the monetary policy boldness of the ECB. That plan includes difficult structural reforms, such as have been implemented here, but it can't be wholly reliant on them. That plan requires greater private risk sharing via banking and capital markets unions. So these efforts, these initiatives are essential. But that plan also needs to recognize that private risk sharing will never fully replace public risk sharing. So it, so it should include what every other successful currency union has at its heart, that is mechanisms to share fiscal sovereignty. As of this evening, progress on structural reforms in the euro area remain uneven. Cross-border risk sharing through the financial system, actual cross-border risk sharing through the financial system has, in the words of President Draghi, shifted backwards. And Europe leaders do not currently foresee fiscal union as part of monetary union. Such timidity has costs. And I think we all know what Jim Flaherty would have said about that. Thank you very much for your attention. We have to answer questions.